Serena recently went on a mission just down the street from here in Africa, right? Do you know how to turn this on? Okay. And she's going to share a few things with us this morning about what she got to do while she was over there. We're so excited for you. So it's all yours. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, so one thing when we're in Africa, the girls would always say to us before they got up and they said something is they'd say, praise God. And everyone else says, amen. So amen. And then they'd say, praise God again. Amen. And then they'd start talking. So um, that was just something cool they did. Um, so I went to Kenya for about two weeks. It was more like 12 days. Oh, we didn't have to start that yet, actually. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll tell you when. Um, I went to Kenya with uh, an organization called Remember New that prevents trafficking through prevention. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about that um, organization a little bit. So um, I guess we can start it now. So <laughs> um, <laughs> we flew there a total of like 24 hours in total of flying, a lot of hours. Um, we got there the first day and we did um, a lot of cultural things. We went to a safari, which is Nairobi's National Park. Um, we went to an area where women made beads to support their family. We went and we um, saw a cultural center. Kenya is made up of 36 different tribes, each speaking their own separate language. On top of that, they all speak Swahili, and then 80% of the population speaks English. So that's three different languages. Um, we then flew three days later to northern Kenya, where we met the girls' home that we were going to put a camp on for. We were with them for five days. We did basically like um, a good news club type of thing, or like a VBS, um, where we did memory verses, we did songs with them, we did games, we acted out Bible stories, just basically um, building their faith um, where they were. They have house parents. Um, I don't know if these really made it in order. They all look out of order. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that was a giraffe center we went to. Uh, it was just a lot of pictures. I think, yeah, I think they're in order now. That's the culture of center we went to where we saw traditional Kenya dances. And that's that. So on the street, they just have like these open markets. Um, where we were, where we went and we flew to northern Kenya to be with the girls, it is not safe for like white people to be out on the streets at all, like at all. The, uh, it's probably not safe for anyone. Uh, <laughs> quite frankly, the, they have walls around all the houses and like electric fences or glass on the walls because it's just a big deal over there. Um, it's just not safe. So we took the girls at this home jump ropes. Um, we took them balloons. They never seen balloons before. We took them tons of things. This house, all 27 girls live in the house. Um, and it's not a big house, by the way. It's small. There's an upstairs and downstairs. Everything they own is in one backpack. That's it. That's all they have. One backpack of clothes. Um, we took them all t-shirts. The church I went with, which is Bridgeport Community Chapel out in Falls City, made them all quilts. So they all had their own quilts at the end. Um, it was really sad to say goodbye, but we did. So after five days of being with them and going to church, we came back to Nairobi area, which is the capital of Kenya. And we visited all the homes that the organization has in the Nairobi area. So we visited seven different homes just saying hi, introducing ourselves, which I thought was the most exhausting of the trip because you have to meet all these people. And then, you know, it's like, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> but um, we met a lot of different people. Uh, this is Joseph. So he is the Kenya director for the organization, Remember New, that I am involved with. And he was with us the whole leg of the trip. And he has a really great story. So he was younger. He grew up in the slums. Uh, we got to visit the slums, by the way, while we were there. Um, him and his two of his brothers, who recently got out of the slums, took us there. 
it was a little scary. We had to get out of the bus at one point, and I was like, um, are we okay? <laughs> and then when they're like, okay, get in the bus, get in the bus, you're like, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> but um, we uh, visited the songs. It's super sad. There's just garbage everywhere and a heap of garbage and people go to the garbage to get food and they go to the garbage to get stuff so that they can make something new out of it and sell it so that they can survive and they live in these like four walls of brick or flashing it's just like it's not a home it's a dirt floor with walls and a roof um yeah, that's some of the garbage on the side of the road that I took a picture of. That's not even the huge garbage heap. Um, there, I saw some of the most disgusting things I'd ever seen over there. I was like, wow. Um, but because it's such a normal thing, no one really thinks about it anymore, which is kind of sad. Um, so I don't know if it went through or not. It looks like some of the same pictures. Um, but back to Joseph, the director of Kenya, he grew up in the slums and when he was younger he could not go to school sometimes because he had nine siblings and his parents couldn't afford to send him to school. So sometimes he would be staying home. Well, one of the times he was stuck home because he couldn't go to school, there happened to be missionaries visiting. They needed an interpreter and um, his pastor was like, Joseph, you can do this. He was younger at the time. I'm really not sure. I thought it was five, but like three other people have said different ages, and I'm like, I don't know anymore. So younger. Um, and he went with them with interpreting, and they asked him, Joseph, why are you not in school? And he said, well, my parents can't afford it. Like right now, I can't go. The missionaries decided to sponsor Joseph, paid for his whole way through high school and college. Um, and now he's the director of Kenya for this organization. Um, so about the organization, the organization is called Remember New. It is preventing trafficking through prevention. So what it does is it goes into an area where children, girls and boys at young ages are at risk, where perhaps their parents are gonna sell them because they want to support their family or they're at danger of just, it's not safe, you know? Um, and they get them out of those situations so that they can get out before the trafficking. Um, and then they have people like us who sponsor these girls and boys, send them through high school, schooling. They get their um, physical education, mental education, spiritual education, you know. Um, this is a boy's home. Three of the boys in this home actually were brothers up there, and their mom was going to kill them. Um, yeah, so that's like what Remember New does. They go in and they get kids out of those type of situations. Um, oh, yeah, we ate a lot of rice over there. <laughs> um, but Remember New is currently in, I think, 16 different countries with 120 different homes right now. Um, and not all of the kids are sponsored. Um, there's lots of kids. The home that I'm in charge of, they're not sponsored at all. Um, would you like to roll that video of the Kenya uh, video for the thing? <laughs> so here's uh, it's a video from Remember News website about the country of Kenya. them and take advantage of them. I was being forced to be circumcised. We are abused from family members. It was very hard to survive there. The United Nations currently estimates that at least 40 million people are being trafficked at any one point in time. 79% of those enslaved are women and children. Men are looking for girls who are wandering around the village and they catch them and go with them away. 1.2 million children are trafficked each year in the worldwide sex trade, more than ever before in history. Kenya stands out as the East African hub for the sex trafficking of children. 
It's estimated that there are over 50,000 children in the commercial sex trade in Kenya alone. The vast majority enter the trade through a parent, family member, or family friend. My life was miserable. I didn't feel safe. Some girls like me were raped or kidnapped. Poverty, the breakdown of the family, addiction, and a lack of opportunity all contribute to making a society where selling children is an option. Remember New is here to offer a better way to redirect the lives of children at risk to end child sex trafficking through prevention. Our staff work with community leaders to identify children at risk and offer to raise them in a safe, secure home. Instead of a life of worry, each child is raised in a loving environment with other children from their community. They have their own bed to sleep in and three meals a day. They attend school, have daily devotions, and help out around the house. On Sunday, they go to church, and perhaps for the first time, they can relax, play, and not worry about where their next meal is coming from. They leave our home as educated, independent young adults. Our research shows that our involvement in a community reduces the risk of a child being used in the sex trade by 77%. Since I came to Remember New, my life's changed. I feel loved. Thank you for sponsoring me, taking me from street to here. Now I have a better life. When Remember New came and helped me, my life started changing. I am born again. I would like to tell the sponsors that I love them. May God bless them for the work of their hands. When I am remember no, I'm so happy because I can type at a laptop or computer. Last year, I graduated from high school with stupendous results, and I thank God because I am now finding hope. I want to be an accountant so that when I get money, I will help the need. When I grow up, I want to work with the remember no team. I want to be a doctor. I would like to become a neurosurgeon. I would like to rescue other girls. I'd like to be a lawyer so that I can fight for the rights of children and for people who can't help themselves. Sponsorship is at the heart of Remember New. It's what makes this prevention possible. Through the monthly giving of sponsors, children can grow up happy, healthy, and safe from the sex trade. To partner with us and to learn more, please visit RememberNew.org. So what impacted me most on the trip was seeing how much sponsoring one child can change the outcome of an entire nation. Um, like I was telling you, Joseph was sponsored when he was just a young boy, and now he is the director for the organization for the entire country, and he's changing lives everywhere. Um, God's used him so much, and God's faithfulness on this trip was amazing, like things I can't even explain that happened. Um, I would really, really like to get our church involved in sponsoring a home in Kenya um, and just to see how much God can change um, the world through just little things is amazing. Um, my trip was really great. I really enjoyed it. I really want to go back. And um, yeah, I really hope that you all would consider sponsorship because I might be out there in a few weeks with a table, you know, hey, come sign up. So <laughs> um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Serena. Was that awesome or what? Yeah. Well, goodbye, kids. 
the movie's over, so they're leaving. Hey, I want to thank all you guys yesterday that uh, helped out with uh, pampering our women. Ladies, did you have a good time yesterday? Yes. Yeah. So we got to play the newlywed game. Huh? That was pretty fun. And of course, the winners were Lonnie and Chris. I'm not sure what they won, but they, they won. So Serena, man, that's a pretty awesome trip, don't you think? Um, you know, it seems like as time is going on, um, opportunities, it would seem, doors that are opening, uh, we're seeing a lot of these opportunities from that region um, in Africa. Um, I've been invited to come over there on a couple of occasions and, and uh, uh, teach at a pastor's training school where they train young men to pastor churches out there. There's a lot of really great things going on over there. I know that when we see the pictures of the dump and the living conditions over there, it's just so heartbreaking to know that people, and not just in this region, but all over the planet are living like that. It's just really, really sad. Won't you be glad when Jesus comes back and all that all that stuff goes away and uh, yeah there's no more hunger no more pain but continue to pray for her and her ministry I think it's really important and uh, pray about supporting uh, that ministry with the child or however she is going to show you that in a couple of weeks she'll be out there in the foyer uh, to share that with you so we want to we want to participate as a church and share some of the blessings that we've had uh, with them over there too. So, all right. Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, please open up to chapter 12. Last few weeks we've talked about some pretty interesting topics. And uh, have you ever heard the saying, uh, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree, huh? We've heard a lot of people say that when, when it comes to perhaps a father and a son, you know, uh, you're the spitting image of your father, which actually when you think about it, that's really our, uh, that's kind of our goal as his children is to be the spitting image of our father, right? So the people will go, I know what family you come from. You come from God's family, and I can tell because of the way you live, and I can tell because of the things that you say. I can tell because you have a, a pure heart, and, and it does show. It does make a difference, and the words that we say are very, very important, the things that come out of our mouth, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk with you a little bit about this morning. The fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. I just want to use that as an example of our actions in life and how they uh, reflect our spiritual nature as people. So let's look in chapter 12 at verse 33 and read down here a little bit. It says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. And by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. We'll stop right there for the moment. So this is, um, Jesus has been dealing with criticism from the Pharisees who were charging him um, with 
doing these great miracles by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and attributing that to Satan. And he's warning them in this particular uh, portion of Scripture to be careful. They're treading very close to stepping over that line. Uh, They're treading very close to committing the unpardonable sin. And, you know, people don't know if we're going to be alive tomorrow. We don't know if we'll be alive tonight. Every moment is a gift. And I believe that that uh, God is so merciful that as long as we have breath in our lungs and our hearts are beating, we have opportunity to give our lives to Jesus. But if we were to die in the condition without having him in our lives, then there would be no forgiveness for sin for us. And, And this is the work we saw of the Holy Spirit, to bring you and I to the cross, to bring you and I to salvation. And by rejecting the salvation that God has provided for you and I, then we find ourselves, well, we don't, but they do, find themselves treading on that danger of leaving this life without salvation and without salvation for their sin and forgiveness. So, you know... He's, he kind of gets interrupted here a little bit because he's warning them about uh, this, this problem that, that they're expressing to him. And he talks to us about these trees and its fruit. And this is probably one of the most basic logical teachings that you find in the Bible. You know, we have little sayings like, you reap what you sow, and, you know, things like that. Jesus, in other parts of the scripture, uh, talks about this very same thing uh, with trees and things like that, but we will look at that a little bit more as we go uh, through here this morning. But, you know, it's interesting when you look at trees. Now, I have some fruit trees at my house, and a lot of you do too, and uh, every spring, we expect the same thing to happen. We expect to see the little leaves coming on and the blossoms and then later on the fruit and we watch it as it ripens and it's just a, you know, every year we go. And we expect a cherry tree to put cherries on itself. We expect an apple tree. I don't walk out to my apple tree looking for thistles. I look for apples, which is just a very, very logical thing. Uh, basic thing. Now, is it possible for my apple tree to bear thistles? No, it's not possible. It's impossible. And so one of the things that Jesus is trying to say here in our text this morning is, you do what you are. If you're a bad tree, he's saying you're going to bear bad fruit. We'll pray for that little guy out there. He's having a bad morning. Um, he has a high voice, though, doesn't he? He was singing the Acapulco there for a little bit. But uh, now over in Matthew 7, Jesus said this. He said, by their fruits you will recognize them. Now here he's talking about false prophets. And he asked the question, he says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? No. Do they pick figs from thistles? No. Likewise, he said, every good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. So thus, by their fruits, you will recognize them. So in this particular case in chapter 7, he's using the example of a fig tree, a grape vine, that was the good tree, or the bad tree being a thorn bush or a thistle. But here's the thing that I find striking in here. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. From its root, its very nature is bad fruit. From the root of the the heart of man, depending on what comes out of our heart, what comes out of our mouth, bears witness 
to the good fruit or the bad fruit in our lives. So Jesus is telling these guys, these religious leaders here, your words are going to condemn you or they're going to justify you. Now, I know a lot of people, when they read verse 37, they get a little bit scared because they think that God's up there writing down every little word that comes out of your mouth. And you might slip, and you might have something come out of your mouth, and right away you think, oh, that wasn't very good for me to say that, right? And we think, okay, God, you got that recorded up there, and I'm going to have to be accountable for that. Here's the thing. It's by your words that you're justified in Christ, It's by your words that you become born again, by your confession of your lips. It's not something you can just think. It's not something you can imagine in your mind. The whole point is here, what's coming out of my heart and coming out of my mouth? Am I a good tree? Am I a bad tree? When I'm in my sinful nature... When I'm apart from Jesus, when I'm walking away or without the Holy Spirit, I cannot bear godly fruit. It's impossible. It's not within my nature to do that. It's not within your nature to do that when you're walking in the flesh. It's impossible for us to please God when we're walking in the flesh. Because the very nature of the flesh is evil. On the other hand, Jesus tells us that when we walk in the Spirit, and this is the the beautiful thing about our faith. A lot of people struggle with their flesh. A lot of people are saying... My goodness, you know, every day I get up and I'm struggling with the things that come out of my mouth and my thoughts and the unforgiveness and all these things going on in my life. And we focus on those negative things all the time. And they begin to condemn us. And they begin to beat us down. They begin to become weights on us. Because we focus on that. Um, I saw an illustration done one time. I didn't want to do it this morning because it's a little bit messy, but I saw a fellow take a, a, a glass, and it was about halfway full of black mud, right? And he, he put this glass down, and he was saying how this is kind of us before Christ. We're filthy inside. And a lot of times, we think we got to get that all cleaned up in there before we can come to see the Lord, before we can meet Him, before we can become born again. we got to clean up our act, Well, that's really not true. He wants us to come just like we are. He wants us to come with our baggage and with our failures and with our faults. He wants us to come as that glass that has the black mud in the bottom of it. And then this guy takes a pitcher of water, and he starts pouring the water in the glass, and the glass fills up, and it's really mucky looking and nasty looking, and as it overflows and he continues to pour water into it, It's not very long before you start seeing the water in the glass start to change. It starts to become clearer. You see that ugly stuff being flushed out of it because it's getting an infusion, if you will, of living water. And we get that infusion of living water flowing in us, and it naturally washes us. That that that. Living water is not focused on the mud. It's focused on filling the vessel. And the two cannot occupy the same space. How many of you know that? I think that's an important one for us to remember. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. That's that living water that God is pouring in us and he's flushing out all that. And you know what? It's just a matter of time before you hold that glass up and it's crystal clear inside. That's how God wants to renew us. That's how he wants to change us from the inside out. Not to focus on the downers, but to allow the good things to flow through me. And therefore, flushing me out, cleaning me out. And Jesus is trying to to share this same principle. When we're living in sin, when a person is living in sin, they cannot please God. It's impossible 
to please God. And so he's trying to give these people some insight. Now, these Pharisees that were attacking Jesus, he's talking about them here. He's talking about the people that were accusing him of doing evil. And Jesus is saying, well, let's just take a second and look at your fruit. And let's take a second and look at my fruit. And let's compare the two. And because you're evil, because you got all the muck in your cup, you cannot bring good fruit. You don't have the capability of it. But let's take a look at your ministry, guys. Let's see what you're doing. And it was pretty obvious what they were doing. They were weighing the people down. They were putting heavy burdens on them. Their fruit of their ministry was seen as bad. It was evidence of the judgment that would come upon them. It was bondage, truly bondage, because they like to have control of people. That's one of the things you find when you get into these legal, uh, legalistic environments. They want, they want to have control over you. The Pharisees were motivated by greed and power and money. They liked to milk the people of their finances. That's another sign that we find today, even now in the churches today, that people want to milk people for their finances. That's not necessary when we're walking with the Lord. Where God guides, God provides, right? I don't need to beg. You don't need to beg. That's why we don't do that, because we do believe that, you know what, God puts that on our hearts to share our resources so that we can see great things done like what Sabrina has just shared with us this morning. Good fruit. Their fruit was bad because it created guilt. It created fear and bondage in people's lives. Some of you grew up in churches like that. Some of you would go to church and go home feeling crummier than when you went to church. You'd feel condemned. You'd feel beat down. And I never believe that God calls a person to be a shepherd of a church so that he can beat the sheep. What's a shepherd do? He feeds the sheep. He cares for the sheep. He loves the sheep. And that's his heart's desire is to see them prosper, not to see them weighed down with guilt, manipulation, and fear. And when Jesus comes on the scene, when he comes into my heart, that's one of the very first things that I noticed, and you probably noticed too, I have a sense of freedom. I feel like I've been lifted up. I feel like I've been set free, and I don't have any fabricated expectations of God. I'm at peace with the Lord. We're at peace, and we allow that flushing of his Holy Spirit in our lives to make us into his image. That's his goal, by renewing our minds, by renewing the way we think. He calls them, interestingly enough here, a brood of vipers. He's talking about snakes. I'm sure you know that. Do you ever watch that uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark movie when... They get thrown in that pit, and there's like thousands of snakes down there, and it looks like the ground's moving around. Is anybody in here not like snakes? Kind of scared of snakes, yeah? Oh, I got to tell you a little story. This will crack you up. I, I just remembered this. When I was attending Calvary Chapel in McMinnville, um, one evening on Wednesday, we were downstairs in the coffee shop doing our Wednesday night Bible study, and Pastor Ron, ironically enough, was in the book of Genesis. And he was talking about the serpent and how he beguiled and deceived um, Eve. And as he was talking about the serpent, he was sharing with us his absolute, total, freak-out fear of snakes, okay? Now, here's a guy that's like six foot six. You would think he fears nothing, well, it doesn't matter if it's a little garter snake or whatever it might be. He's got this phobia, right? So we're sitting there and we're talking and behind him is the door that goes into the kitchen and he's saying how snakes are horrible and all. And everybody looks down and underneath the door of the kitchen slithers a gopher snake. 
right out of the kitchen. And everybody's looking at the snake, and they're looking at Ron, and they're looking at the snake. He doesn't know it's back there. And somebody pointed it out, and it was quite the reaction to see. I've never seen a big man move so quick. I'm not really afraid of him, so I just got him, walked over and picked it up. And, of course, everybody's going, ew, you know. It's just a snake. But uh, nevertheless, people do have a fear. So when Jesus uses the term viper here, boy, we know exactly uh, what he's talking about. He's talking about a, a, a reptile who knows one thing and one thing only. He wants to bite you and poison you and take you down. You can't reason with it. You can't sit there and say, now why don't you just, instead of biting, why don't you lick? That'd be kind of nicer than biting, right? Why don't you lick instead? You know, no, you can't do that because he cannot be changed because that's exactly what he is. Jesus is making that same case with these Pharisees. You're evil because you have evil hearts. And evil hearts are very, very predictable. Evil hearts produce evil fruit. Barnes, in his notes, said that they were a wicked race of people, like poisonous reptiles with a corrupt and evil nature. They could not be expected to speak good things, that is, to speak favorably of him and his works. As the bad fruit of a tree was the proper effect of its nature, so were the words about him and his works the proper effect of their nature. They could not praise him for his works because they were evil. And that's why he tells us right here, you cannot bring good things out of your evil heart. You, they might even, he still calls a treasure here, but we wouldn't think of it as uh, being a, a treasure truly, but they did because of the power that they wielded. And so, really, really important here that Jesus is trying to share with them, hey, look, you're evil. You can't say anything good. On the other hand, there's a good tree over here with good roots, with good fruit. It's planted in a good place. You know, in the wintertime, all those fruit trees at our houses, if you're not, if you're not schooled on what tree is what, you might not be able to tell the difference. You might go in there and look at all the fruit trees and say, wow, they all look the same. None of them have leaves. They all have these little branches that are empty. They all look very similar. So which one's the apple and which one's the cherry? And if you're not educated in those things, then you can be deceived very easily and not have any clue what kind of tree it is until spring comes, until those things begin to bud. And so a lot of times, Jesus is telling us that these bad trees, the bad fruit, might be in disguise. People may not recognize it at first when they become involved with that until the fruit begins to show on the tree. And so this question that Jesus is asking, theoretically, yeah, a person can say good things, an evil person. But those good things are coming from an evil heart. They're coming from an evil or ulterior motive, if you will. Maybe they want attention. Maybe they want to get their way or whatever it might be. And so they're using this illusion of kindness or truth in order to get what they want to get out of you or out of the situation. And so it's really important when he says in verse 37, it's by your words that you're going to be acquitted. It's by your words that you're going to be condemned. You know, when Jesus was talking about being born again, one of the things that he said was, those who are in darkness are already condemned. They're not going to be condemned. They're already condemned. They're already separated from God because of their sinful nature, because of their fallen nature. So the condemnation is already there. I've been found guilty. And Jesus is saying, you know, what you say reveals your character. What you do when what you say reveals your heart. And it can be bad or it can be good. I have an opportunity by my words to be acquitted by coming before the Lord and saying, God, forgive me of my sin. I've been running from you for so long. 
and I want to confess my sins to you. In 1 John 1, 9, it says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, and he will forgive our sin, and not just forgive our sin, but he will purify us from all unrighteousness. That's really awesome when you think about it. It's one thing to be forgiven, but it's another thing to know that I'm being purified by that washing, by that infusion of God's Spirit in my life. And what does it mean to confess when he says, if you confess your sin, if you confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead and believe in your heart that, that he's the Lord, you will be saved. So we see that there's a heart-tongue connection going on in the scripture right here. If you confess and believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Not very complicated, is it? He said, because it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. So it's a warning to them. It's a warning to us. It's, a, it's, a, it's an education to tell me, you know what, in my sinful nature, there's no way that I can get my act together. In my sinful nature, there's no way that I could experience God's love in my life because I just don't have that. I don't have the capability of it. i got to have God's Spirit. And so in verse 38, some of them came to him, and they're still, I don't think they heard a word he said. Sometimes I feel like that, you know, when you ever talk to somebody, and you feel like you're trying to share something with them, and they walk away, and you think, I don't think they heard a word I said, right? Um, how important is it that we are able to retain some of these uh, awesome things that God's teaching us? Um, so when we get to verse 38, they're still at it. It doesn't appear that they've learned anything. So the Pharisees and the scribes, they, this is their answer. After all this wonderful logic coming from Jesus, here's their answer. Will you show us a miracle? We want a sign from you. We want our own special sign from you. Now think about this. He's cast out demons. He's healed the sick. He's given sight to the blind. He's fed the hungry. He's done just about every miracle you can possibly imagine. And they're coming up to him and saying, will you show us a miracle? We want our own special miracle. And in verse 39, he said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. First example, the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So as Jesus is going throughout Galilee, and he's preaching, and he's teaching in their synagogues, sharing the good news of the kingdom, and these people want a sign. Have you ever heard somebody say that the story of Jonah is just mythology? That it's, you know, it really didn't happen. It's, it's in the Bible, though, to teach us a good moral lesson. But it really didn't happen. It's just a made-up story. Well, you know, I've always wanted evidence that j the story of Jonah was true, that it was real. And what greater evidence could a person have to read the words of Jesus Christ himself verifying that this event really took place. You think Jesus would tell them this if it was just a made-up story? He's telling them this is a fact. This is history. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of that fish, and so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights. And you know what? Because of what Jonah did, the people of Nineveh, they repented. That, that whole generation of people in Nineveh, which was a huge city, a very wicked city, they repented. 
And I, I don't know, maybe, jo maybe Jonah's appearance after three days in digestive juices, no telling what the man looked like as he came up on the beach when the, you know, fish belched him out and, you know, he's probably bleach white and who knows, no hair left or, you know, and he goes marching into Nineveh and people freak out and I'm repenting. I don't want to turn out like this guy. I'm repenting, right? Now, here's the sad thing, though. Because, yes, they did repent. But you know what? It was only one generation later. A hundred years later, they rejected all of Jonah's preaching. All the people who repented had died. A whole new generation came up behind them, and they were worse off than the generation that Jonah preached to. And judgment did eventually come to Nineveh, and it was destroyed. God's judgment did come upon them. So, you know, when I look at that, I think, okay, we've confessed this, but it's only good for one generation. We need to reach out to the next generation, too. They need to have their own experience of repentance and learning about Jesus and learning about the things of life. And so he gives this example of the people of Nineveh. Now, there was another one here in verse 42. The queen of the south, or the queen of Sheba, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. You know, he's not giving up on these Pharisees. He's not giving up on anybody. Everybody can come and say, I want new life. I want change in my life. I want to be a truly, I want to be a child of God. We all have that opportunity, even as these people did. And so in verse 33, and a lot of times we see these verses that are coming up and we think, this must be talking about demon possession. Because we've seen him cast out demons here as we've been going through Matthew. Look what it says. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. And then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty and swept and put in order. And then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now here's the key to the whole story. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. He's talking about Israel here. He's talking about the Jewish people. He's talking about the religious system that they can go in and they can clean it up and they can sweep it out and they can get rid of all that negative stuff in there. But if you don't fill it up with something, right? If you don't fill it up with Jesus, then it's going to be once again occupied by this deceptive, demonic spirit, if you will. And if you don't think that demonic spirits were working through the Pharisees, I would disagree I would say they were. They put him on the cross. They're the ones that hated him to the point that they wanted to kill him. We saw just a few weeks ago when uh, Jesus was preaching in the synagogues and the things that he was saying to them bothered them so much. It said, from that time forward, they sought how they might kill him. They want to snuff him. They want to silence him. He's very aware of what's going on. And still, I mean, you know, he could be saying, I can't wait until judgment day when I got all you little scrawny Pharisees down there and I get to put you in the pit, you know. He's not saying that at all. At this point, he's still saying, wake up. Look at the situation that's going on inside you because there's still hope for you if you choose that. And we know from history and from our study of the Word, they did not choose that. Why does he call them a adulterous generation? You know, Jesus refer, or God the Father refers to the, to the Jews many times in the Old Testament as his wife, his beloved. And, and 
The Old Testament is filled with analogies and stories of this wife of God who is not faithful to her husband. She goes out and she has relations with all kinds of different other gods, evil gods. And he's talking about the Jewish people. They did terrible things. They worshiped horrible gods. They were committing spiritual adultery. And that's what he's referring to here. Not just the the, the physical adultery, but he's referring to their nation as a one person committing spiritual adultery, and yet here they come asking for a sign. I think Jesus had given them enough evidence. Now, in the New Testament church, you know, uh, we're, we're considered the bride of Christ. And if we're not faithful to Jesus in our hearts, then we too are committing spiritual adultery. So verse 46 says, While he was still talking to the multitudes, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. And one of them said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and he said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and he said, Here is my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Interesting. Doesn't that seem kind of harsh to you? That Jesus is kind of ignoring his family and, and saying, hey, you know, yeah, if you really want to meet my brother, you got you to be obedient to me. I think what he's doing here is he's, he's talking about two different levels of commitment here. My mother and my brother, that's in the physical flesh realm, the bloodline realm. But when I have a relationship with Jesus, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond just a physical relationship. It becomes a spiritual relationship. And it's interesting to me that as Jesus is saying this, he's not disrespecting his mom. And by the way, notice that Jesus says that he has brothers. Find that interesting? Huh? That the perpetual virginity of Mary is taught, but yet he has brothers. And we find out also that he has sisters. They're not his cousins. They're his brothers. And they're his sisters. And so, yes, his mom, Mary, had children after he was born. It's in the Bible. You know, isn't it a bummer, though, how people can uh, come up with these ideas and, and, and insert them into doctrine and make them as though they're truly taught in the Bible when there's nothing taught like that at all in the Bible? Pretty amazing. And for thousands of years, people have held on to these things, even though you can't validate them in Scripture. That's why it's so important that you know the Word. That's why it's so important that we understand what the Bible has to say as a whole, as a balanced message to us. Yeah, Nineveh repeated, uh, repented to a regular man, to Jonah. But here they are resisting Christ. And the Queen of Sheba, yeah, they, 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 that was a big deal too. To come and hear the wisdom of Solomon. But here they are rejecting the Son of God and the wisdom that he wants to share. So he says in verse 50, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. What is the will of his Father who is in heaven? That's the first question I would ask. I'll do the will, but I need to know what it is. You know, a man came to Jesus one time and he said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What are the works that I must do? Cut my hair, take a bath, get a job, go on a diet, do, you know, try to clean myself up? What, what do I need to do? 
And Jesus answered and said, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom the Father has sent. Jesus. That's it. That's the works of God that you need to do in order to get to heaven, is to believe on the one whom the Father has sent, speaking of himself, of course. So this morning, that's where it brings us. It brings us back around in a big circle. What are we doing to be accepted into the kingdom of God? Are we struggling? Are we fighting? Are we wrestling with it? Or are we at peace with it? Why don't we have the worship uh, team come on up? You know, I think a lot of times as we learn Scripture in the Bible and we're learning about what Word God has to say concerning certain things, it makes you accountable once you've heard them. We can't plead ignorance, right? Because we know. The question is, what are we going to do with what we know? Are we going to take that treasure that God has given us and invest it in the things of the kingdom of God? Are we going to take our priorities and maybe adjust them and get them arranged in the proper way so that I can receive everything that God wants for me to receive? And I want you to know this morning, maybe if you're struggling with that, if you need prayer, we have an opportunity for you to get prayer this morning before you leave. I look around every Sunday, and I pretty much see the same faces, and I make the same offer to you every week. And I know that probably 99.99% of you in here are born again, and you love Jesus. And you're probably thinking, I don't need to go up there for prayer. It's all good. Well, it's an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us to do some housekeeping, maybe, with the Lord. It's an opportunity for us to keep our hearts humbled and soft before Him. So if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and He's saying you need prayer, then take heed to that voice this morning and get some prayer. It's really, really... Do you know prayer changes things? Do you believe that? I absolutely do. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we want to thank you this morning because our prayers do change things. The power, Lord, that, that we have in, in speaking in your name is, is, is the power of the living God Almighty. And we're so thankful this morning, Lord, that we have been given that very, very power and authority to speak good things, to be good trees that bring forth good fruit, the, the, the natural uh, outcome of a healthy tree being good fruit. And we thank you this morning, Lord, that you've planted us in good soil. You've planted us beside the rivers of water, of the Holy Spirit that nourishes us. You've given us the sun, Lord, to allow our leaves to come out and allow us to bear fruit. God, we give all the glory and praise to you this morning. Lord, open our eyes, our hearts. Keep us softer in these difficult times in which we live. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.